we'll talk about white light imaging with diffractive optics, uh, which is a topic that I love. And diffractive optics is so powerful, right? And nobody almost uses it because of chromatic dispersion. But this uh, lab has ideas of how we can solve that and do white light imaging. And we have 20 minutes, and then within that, we have time for questions, right? So when you, when you do this, um, there's uh, a lot of um, different um, areas that you draw from, inverse problems, uh, computer vision, uh, also perception, and of course numerical methods, and they all have to play together to actually um, uh, you know, design systems. So today I will talk about a specific niche in that big space, which is uh, um, photography with DOEs. And so there are, all the, all the things that I will talk about today um, are basically together with these two gentlemen here, so Felix Heide and, uh, and Gordon Wettstein. So we have like a string of papers together. Um, so Felix just joined Princeton University and Gordon has been um, at, MI, at, at Stanford for uh, I think three, four, four years now. Um, so before I get into diffractive optical elements, let me just um, sort of try to e explore this question of what are good optics for computational cameras. So, of course, optics as a discipline has for, you know, over the, over the many, many decades now, um, very uh, compellingly answered the question of what is good optics, period. But what is good optics for uh, computational imaging? And is it different from, from good optics for, um, uh, for traditional cameras? So the motivation I want to start with is basically this um, you know, schematic of a, um, of a commercial um, zoom lens with a, for an SLR. And you can see that there is a huge number of optical elements here. Um, and um, they are needed in order to have high resolution sensors back here because the higher resolution sensor you want, this, the more you need to correct for higher and higher order aberrations if you don't have any computation, right? So um, this is the design, you can buy it, this is traditional um, uh, optical design process. Um, and the problem is that, you know, glass is not really uh, following Moore's law, okay? So it doesn't get cheaper, it doesn't get lighter, uh, it doesn't get smaller. And so one of the questions that uh, we can maybe try to address with computational imaging is basically how do we reduce uh, the hardware components in a camera and um, how do, sh do we shrink everything? And so we can go back uh, you know, 150 years and try to do imaging with uh, very simple optical elements. In this case, would just be a plano convex lens. And um, so that's really the simplest refractive optical element that you can imagine, right? It's flat on one side and it has a spherical surface on the other side. And then we can try and correct for all the optical aberrations in software. Now, when you do this in combination with a very high resolution modern image sensor where you have you know, tens of megapixels potentially, you very quickly reach the limits of what you can do. So in particular, these are the point spread functions 
of this optical system for different parts of the, uh, of the image plane. So in the middle, you see sort of more like disc-like uh, structures, and then you see coma, a lot of, so this is spherical aberration, and you see a lot of coma um, in the, in the ed on the edges, right? And the big problem here is um, if you have a high resolution image sensor, this actually, these point spread functions are huge. They have a diameter of, let's say, uh, 70 or 80 pixels. And then when you s use standard deconvolution methods, they actually really um, fail very rapidly uh, and, and really don't produce a very good uh, image at all. However, with modern um, methods, okay, you can actually do this. So this is actually a, on the left-hand side is the raw capture from the, from the simple planar convex lens. And on the right-hand side is actually a reconstruction. And this is a pan across uh, um, an image plane of, I think it was at that time a 12 megapixel uh, image sensor, but I, I don't remember the exact number. You can see that text becomes more legible. You can reconstruct things quite well. There are some artifacts, including this one. Um, but, you know, overall, I think the image quality is actually really quite good. Um, especially given that you started with a, basically, again, the, the simplest refractive optics that you can possibly imagine, right? And so I won't talk uh, about exactly how we achieved this, but one of the key things that we found in that work is that, um, in fact, the chromatic aberration that you could see in, this, in these point spread functions here can actually be beneficial for the reconstruction, okay? So this is really, um, if you're a traditional optical design person, this is actually very counterintuitive because when you, the moment you move from, um, from one, so just a simple lens element to multiple elements, the first thing that you would normally remove in optical design is actually chromatic aberration, okay? But here it actually turns out because the blur is actually slightly different in the different color channels, that means there is actually different information destroyed in the different color channels, and you can actually patch together the information from different color channels to actually reconstruct um, all uh, a, a larger number of frequencies in the end. So this is kind of the the insight here that started a lot of the the work that we, that we did later, which is that the optimal designs for computational cameras might be actually quite different from the traditional optical design. So the moment you open up the door for doing computational reconstruction, then you can actually design lenses differently and actually access different, uh, different parts of the design space, okay? So, and in particular, this notion that a limited amount of, and this is important, a limited amount of, of chromatic aberration can actually be beneficial. Okay, so we did, um, uh, a lot of work on putting this into, uh, you know, uh, 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 this, this kind of prior that, um, that, uh, that we did for that paper, together with other reconstruction methods into, a, um, into an optimization-based framework for arbitrary reconstruction or for very general reconstruction problems uh, in imaging. Um, so this was a paper called Flex ISP. And in fact, we were able to show that when you basically replace standard reconstruction pipelines, um, uh, which are also very, which are very much pipelined as well, right? So you have a, a demosaicing, de then you have denoising, and all those kinds of things. And if you actually replace these pipelines with sort of a single integrated optimization method, which uses uh, uh, dedicated terms such as um, the cross-channel prior, which I didn't really explain uh, from the from the previous slides, when you actually combine these in this framework, then you can actually tackle a very large number of um, reconstru image reconstruction problems and actually uh, get much, much better output. So even from, for standard uh, image demosaicing, which has, you know, uh, thousands of papers published with uh, very specific algorithms uh, to tackle just this problem, if you just use this framework, uh, you can actually get two, uh, two de decibel signal to noise improvement, um, you know, com uh, with a general framework. Okay, so with this, um, now let's talk about color imaging with diffractive optics, right? So um, the big obstacle here, of course, is that the chromatic aberration is, is extremely large, okay? So if you um, basically, you can, uh, you can take a, I mean, what's been known for, for a long time is you can, 
basically have this very specific diffractive attribute element for the uh, Fresnel zone plate. And you basically, if you do this either as an amplitude modulated mask or as a phase modulated mask, um, then you can focus a single wavelength at a certain distance, okay? And you can do this in binary, like shown here, or you can do it in with stair steps or ideally with uh, also with uh, smooth transitions, okay? Um, but the problem is this really only works for one wavelength. So if we're going to look at point spread functions, so the green is the design wavelength here, and it's for, for green light, 500 nanometers, and it's pretty sharp. Um, but if you look at the red and the blue, uh, which are at 450 and 650 nanometers, then you basically see that um, the point spread functions become really enormous. And this is uh, down here, the, the x-axis is pixels, okay, for whatever image sensor we chose there. So before I was talking about point spread functions with a diameter of maybe 70, 80 pixels, now we're talking about 500 plus pixels. And that's just no longer really um, re revertible at all, right? So what you can do is you can try and combine diffractive optical elements together with um, refractive ones. And of course, this is a approach that industry has been taking um, to basically uh, use the, the chromatic aberration from the diffractive optical elements to cancel out the, ref, uh, the refractive uh, chromatic aberration and, vi and vice versa. Um, what we wanted to do though is we wanted to design just a very thin diffractive optical element um, that by itself is essentially achromatic, okay? And the idea is that we're gonna sacrifice some sharpness for the center wavelength for having a point spread function that's basically achromatic, okay? And then the small blur that we get with this, uh, at the center wavelength, which is now not just for the center wavelength, but for all wavelengths, we can remove that computation too. Okay, so um, one thing, a simple uh, thing that you could imagine how you could try, try to approach this with a manual design is that you could just say, okay, I'm going to take my aperture and I'm going to optimize for say 10 wavelengths over the spread out over the whole visible wave, uh, spectrum and I guess basically split my aperture into 10 regions and in each region I have essentially the pattern for a Fresnel zone plate for that particular wavelength right so you could basically that, that's maybe how you would design it if you if you if you did it manually um, and that actually kind of works, but uh, actually it's not very good. So b before we had this point spread function, um, and if you do this, uh, this design where you, where you just uh, have the 10 zones and uh, the Fresnel zone plate for one wavelength in each of the zones, then you get this kind of point spread function, which is a bit better. You know, you, know, you can see now that uh, you know, the other wavelengths also have um, uh, some, uh, some, some better uh, definedness and there's some high sp spatial frequencies in there that you can, uh, that you can maybe hope to recon reconstruct from. Um, but really what we, uh, what we did is actually turn this into an optimization problem, okay? So the optimization problem is simply, um, we're actually going to optimize for a cross-sectional height profile. We have a rotational symmetry here, so it's really just a 1D height profile that we're optimizing. And we're optimizing it in such a way that the point spread functions are actually the same for all the different wavelengths. And at the same time, we're trying to keep the, um, uh, the point spread function as compact as, as possible. And um, so these are some of the results that you can see there. Um, clearly, we lose some sharpness, again, for the, for the center wavelength, but all the point spread functions are now um, uh, sort of basically the same across all the wavelength, wavelength range. So this is what you, what, you, what you can do when you basically put optimization methods into the optical design. And the diffractive optical elements are actually extremely uh, interesting for this kind of uh, situation because they can actually, uh, they're just a very powerful design space. Um, you can take this um, uh, kind of optimization problem to, to, to um, and, and sort of similar uh, but, but, but different pr uh, problems in the optical space. So here is a design of uh, not just one DOE, but actually two DOEs that are basically in alignment with each other. And when they are aligned in one way, they uh, represent a lens of a certain focal length. But then as you start rotating them, the focal length changes, okay? So this is basically 
a, a focus tunable diffractive optical element that, uh, that is focus tuned by a rotation of one element relative to the other. Um, and if you combine two of these, you can actually build a zoom lens. And uh, now you have a zoom lens, then, so it's two of these pairs, so four, four diffractive optical elements to total. You ha now have a zoom lens, which doesn't have any translational motion out along the optical axis, only rotational uh, motion around the axis. So uh, that's, uh, you know, again, based on these kind of optimization methods uh, for, for dif optimizing the height field correctly. Now, where this is all going now is um, that we're ac actually starting to see uh, really fully end-to-end -end designs. So what I talked about so far is in fact, we, we still have sort of an optical design phase and then a reconstruction phase. And the two are informed with the, by each other, but they're in fact not, um, it's not co-designed. So in more recent work, um, we've actually started really working on the co-design uh, where we uh, come up with fully differentiable uh, image formation pipelines. So in this case, again, we're optimizing a height field for that gives us a certain PSF. That process is a fully differentiable process. Uh, so you can feed an image database into it. You can uh, then have a fully differentiable reconstruction model and um, you can train that against some loss function, which could just be image quality, but it could also be something more abstract like uh, object classification schemes or whatever do a domain specific uh, uh, problem you have. And then you can actually train this whole pipeline end to end. You can update your reconstruction methods as well as the, uh, the, the optical design itself uh, at the same time. So I'm gonna skip over, maybe I'm just gonna show you, this is an extended depth of field um, example. <laughs> maybe I'll just play this video to show your comparison. So this is on the, on the left hand side. So again, this is um, with, uh, on the left hand side, this, uh, this is um, uh, uh, just a biconvex lens in this case. And on the right hand side is a, uh, is a lens with, uh, with our, a diffractive lens with our uh, design and uh, it uh, has a really extended depth of field in this case. Okay, I'm running out of time, so let me just um, go to, sorry, go to uh, one thing I want to, I want to mention. So all of these optical design things that I talked about, they're in fact also related to actually optical implementations of neural ne networks as well. So once you have these fully differentiable image formation models, you can, you can, uh, you can actually optimize uh, the optics. Now you can decide whether certain convolutional layers in your network, for example, you want to implement optically or, or in software. And here is, for, exa for an example, an, an, an optical way to actually implement uh, a convolutional layer. Now what I, what I want to emphasize is that this is uh, currently just the convolution. There's no non-linearity possible right now. Unfortunately, optics is a bit hard uh, to get a lot of the, get, the, get like a ReLU implemented or something like that. So you have to go back to electronics for now, um, but it's a, a first step and we're looking further in this direction. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I think we can have one or two questions. Uh, Nobody dares to do the single question we have time for. I will do it myself. So this is beautiful work with the Fresnel lens. Um, what depth of focus do you have there? It's, it's many, many meters, and the resolution is very good. We didn't see any chromatic aberration. Is that deconvolved, recomputed? Yeah, yeah, this is all, all of this is, is um, so the, the, the optical, all of these systems are computational designs, right? So they, there's always a reconstruction phase uh, that, that follows, right? I never just show, uh, raw raw sensor data, except for t to demonstrate how bad it actually looks mm -hmm. by itself. <laughs> no, that's that's very yeah. impressive. Thank you. Uh, well, yeah. So for the first work on the cross channel, uh, yeah. do you need to calibrate for each different camera, or how how does um, like for the simple lens? No, no, not really. In fact, uh, the same prior can be can be applied to um, anything that has, has multiple color channels. It, I mean, it's, it, I, we can talk offline about what the ch what the prior actually is, it, but it basically just uh, intuitively it's just a, it's just a prior that says edges should appear in the same pixel locations 
everywhere in the image. So, so they shouldn't, you know, if I have an edge in a red, in a red uh, channel and an edge in the green channel, they should ideally be in the same place rather than one pixel offset. And you can express that mathematically as a triad.